What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the e-commerce influence podcast. My name is Austin Bronner, and I've got an awesome episode for you today. If you have been a member of my community, you know that a lot of the stuff we talk about is how to build your business into something that you can sell. We've got multiple trainings in the coalition about this, and it's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about automation and subscription revenue. Today, we're bringing in John Warlow. John is the author of three books, uh, The Built to Sell is the first book, The Automatic Customer, and his latest book, which is The Art of Selling Your Business. And John has sold multiple businesses. He works with companies to help them sell for higher multiples. And today's episode, we dive deep into how you can increase your multiple, uh, ways you can build a more valuable company, biggest mistakes people make, how to have a successful exit. And the conversation is fantastic. John is super sharp and I'm happy to bring it to you guys. So without further ado, welcome John to the show. John, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. Ah, it's good to be here, Austin. So I've read actually all three of your books. Um, God, and you're still standing to, uh, still... to live to tell the tale. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I had, I've had a bunch of my, my uh, clients and some friends that have gone through a process to sell their, their business recently. Like they've, all, they've been selling their businesses. So I was up reading your book, your, most, your newest book last night, and it was fantastic. Um, I was really engrossed in it. And w- as I was reading, I was kind of thinking, you're like the anti Jim Collins. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I've never heard uh, described that way, but you're right. <laughs> so I'm interested. Uh, why, awesome. why, why are you so passionate about building businesses that you can sell? Because I don't think entrepreneurship should be a life sentence. I don't believe the the BS about like building your business for hundreds of years. I think for most of us as entrepreneurs, you know, we do our best work in a creative setting where for the first couple of years, there's a premium paid on problem solving, on overcoming challenges. And once a business reaches a few million in annual revenue, there's probably someone else better to sell it, to, to build it. And, and for a lot of us, we run our businesses by inertia, right? Just because that's what we, we've been doing as opposed to because that's what we love what we do. I, I remember one of the guys that, that I recently interviewed on my podcast is a guy named uh, Joey Redner. Uh, have you ever had him on the show? I have not. No, he's he's worth getting on. He's a, he's a great uh, great guest. He he talks about the the creation of his brewery, and he built a, a a brewery called Cigar City Brewery in Tampa, Florida, where they didn't have a lot of craft beer. He built a craft you know br- brand, if you will, and borrowed a bunch of money from his dad and got the brewery off the ground, sold out really quickly. And so much so that they had to expand brewing capacity and they went to build out another facility and he borrowed money, not only from his dad, but nothing from a bank. So now he's in hawk to both his dad and the bank launches the ne- you know the next tranche of brewing capacity and the thing sells out again all of the regional you know bars and restaurants in in, in Florida were more carrying his beer and he ran out of brewing capacity for the third time and I said what was that like Johnny and he said it felt like I was like the the, the gambler at the blackjack table and I just won like five hands in a row and and, yeah. the, and the dealer was like okay put it all back in and and he said I'm, I'm out I, you know I've done what I tried like that, this is beyond what I wanted to ever do yeah. and he sold a business he sold a business to Oscar Blues you know private equity bra- amazing exit he put a bunch of money in his jeans you know, paid off everybody rode off into the sunset and I don't think I don't think he's he he should be looked down upon for for selling his business. I think he did what he wanted to do, and I think he should be celebrated for that, as opposed to chastised for not building to last, as uh, as as some others you know talk about. Sure, I, I think it's a, I think it's a great viewpoint to have, and one of the reasons I I really enjoyed reading the book um, and all of your books is because of that viewpoint. It kind of resets. What are you doing this for? And Towards the beginning of this this book, um, Art of Selling Your Business, there's a part where you talk about a distinction between people who've had a successful exit and those who have not. 
what is the secret? I mean, you've looked at tons and tons and tons of businesses and help people sell their business. What is the secret to having a happy and successful exit? Hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I just did an interview uh, last week with a guy who sold his business for a truckload of money, like I, high seven figures, low eight figures, you know, enough to live for the rest of his life. Yeah. And and I said, what was that like to get the check? Like when you got the wire, and he said, I you know I was in the closing office of my the the the, the law office where I was, and I was refreshing my phone to see the bank account balance. Refresh, 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 and finally, boom, it showed up. And there's a ton of zeros on a bank account like never before. Have you, he said I had to leave the room because I knew I was going to break down in tears. He left the room, went home, and ended up in a puddle of grief, just sheer unadulterated emotion. Uh, from selling this thing that had been his life for you know more than a decade. And I think that's a very common reaction for a lot of entrepreneurs. We fall in love with our businesses. In many cases, it's like our reason for being. And selling it can be in a very emotional roller coaster. There's obviously the high of, of, of achieving what you set out to sure. achieve and having this you know financial outcome that's almost unbelievable at times. Yet at the same time, uh, it can be very emotional. So, so what I have found is the secret is making sure you have lots of pull factors. And pull factors are the things you want to go do. I, I did an interview with a guy uh, named Sean Oshman. Sean built a great little IT services company in Denver, Colorado. Of course, Denver is landlocked, right? So yep. there's kind of no water anywhere near. And Sean, on his 39th birthday, said, you know what? I've had this lifelong dream to live my life on a sailboat. And again, he's in Denver, he's in landlocked Denver. And he says, okay, well, the only way I'm going to do this is I'm going to sell my company. So he hires a broker, broker comes back and gets him an offer. I think it was like two and a half times profit for his company. And, and I interviewed him and I said, you know, Sean, like, like two and a half times is like, it's okay. Like, you know, his business was relatively small, so it wasn't like a terrible number, but it was sort of an average multiple. And, and I said, like, how do you feel about that now? And he's like, I'm, I'm totally thrilled. And I'm like, but it was only two and a half times. He said, but yeah, John, you're missing the point. I was like, what's that? He's like, I live on a sailboat. <laughs> and, yeah. and what he reminded me of is that, that the happiest exits are the ones where the entrepreneur not only sells f- for a fair multiple, but also has something they want to go do next. And in Sean Oshman's case, he wanted to live on a sailboat. And so he was totally happy with two and a half times profit for his company because he had a very clear vision on what's next. And so for a lot of entrepreneurs, I think that's that's where we have to do the heavy thinking, soul searching is like, you're not going to, I mean, you go hundred miles an hour, you build a business uh, for you know seven, eight figure, nine figure exit. You're not going to just sit on the beach and, and, or rock on your porch and with a drinking lemonade thinking like, you know, about the old days, like you're going to go do something else. So getting clear on what that is, I think is, is one of the real sort of secrets to making sure you're satisfied and happy with your, your decision. I mean, it's, it goes parallels very much with, uh, I, I thought of the Dan Sullivan, make sure your future is bigger than your past, right? And if you, if your past is larger than your future and you just, transition you sell your business especially if you're young in your 30s or some of the people that i've worked with have sold their business in their like late 20s that's a crazy thing to go into where everything is tied to it your identity your self-worth is tied to it and then it's gone and you just got members in a bank account which again people will say it's a good problem to have but it doesn't mean that it's not a existential threat to your to your life in the sense that you don't know now you have to reorient about where you're going i think it's it's fascinating and it's it's one of the reasons i'm interested in people selling their business and the psychology behind it what one of the questions Dude, that- i've got to figure out what existential means i have heard that word now like a hundred thousand times during this pandemic it feels like existential is like the word that everybody uses and i don't have a clue what it means what like what does existential actually mean uh what what I would describe it as is is like a uh, a threat outside. Well, in my sense, I was saying like a threat outside of your physical. Uh, like, okay, but it's it's like a a real feeling that you will have that is going to cause you problems, but it's not like a physical 
you're not going to be harmed, right? Got but it's it. an actual like feeling of being and meaning. That's a problem of being uh, and meaning. I should have paid way more attention in English class. <laughs> it's a stupid failing of mine. Um, I'm, in, I'm interested. You, so I, I won't get through this interview without asking you this because it's a question that I get asked all the time. And I know sure. I'm sure you get asked all the time. How much should I get for my business? What's a good multiple for an e-commerce oh, business? <laughs> oh, that's right? a tough one. Yeah, yeah, that is a tough one. You know, I don't mean to dodge the question, but I don't know that there's always a clean <laughs> way to answer it. Um, yeah, look, I think I think an e-commerce business, especially one that's not relying on Amazon for distribution, like if you've actually got your own fulfillment through your own website, I think it can be a very lucrative company. It's going to be worth more to a strategic buyer than it would be to a financial buyer. So right now, you've got sort of three types of buyers in the marketplace, right? You've, yeah. you've got individual investors who are buying very small companies. So if you've got a, f a small e-commerce company, say a million in revenue, uh, something around there, an individual investor might buy that business. And they're really buying, uh, usually on a multiple of profit, uh, relatively modest. You've got private equity groups who are oftentimes stitching together other companies in your space. So let's say you have a supplements business and you've got a bunch of customers who buy from your website. Well, there are private equity companies rolling up supplements businesses right now. And they're they're doing the kind of one plus one equals three strategy. And those guys are paying slightly higher multiples than individual investors generally. And then you've got strategic advisors, strategic investors, excuse me, who for whom the value of your company is worth more in their hands than it is in your hands. And they are really paying the highest multiples. And that's when you can see quite astonishing multiples uh, and that really almost fly in the face of what a traditional valuation would be. So I'll give you an example. Um, there's a guy named Jay Steinfeld who, I don't know if you've ever had Jay on the show. He built blinds.com. No, I haven't had him on the Tre show. Tremendous e-commerce story. I think he would be a great guest for you. He uh, So Jay built blinds.com uh, right in the time that Jeff Bezos was starting Amazon. Uh, Jay Steinfeld thought about blinds and he's like, well, if Bezos can sell books, I can sell blinds. The only problem with blinds is that they are complicated to install. You, you know, you got to get somebody to install them. They're, they're complicated to measure. You got to pick the color. There's a lot of complexity to it. And so blinds.com did not grow anywhere near as quickly as amazon.com, but they had a very similar trajectory in that they kind of stayed focused for many, many years. Jay and Jeff are similar age and Jeff decided to sell recently. And when he did, he looked around and said, okay, who would have a strategic reason to buy this company? And what he realized is that Home Depot would have a tremendous sort of double value proposition in buying blinds. Because number one, they blinds.com was kicking the crap out of Home Depot in the blinds category. They were doing more than $100 million in revenue. Blinds.com was doing $100 million in revenue. Home Depot was nowhere even close to that. So Home Depot could get to be number one in the blinds category just by acquiring blinds. That's number one. But the hidden reason is much more interesting. The hidden reason was that Home Depot had something like a couple hundred, uh, I'm, I'm going to get the number wrong, but, but hundreds of billions of dollars in total annual revenue, I believe, or at least a hundred billion dollars in annual revenue. That much of which right. was yeah, much of which was done through home the Home Depot stores. And the executives at Home Depot were like, they're racking their brains saying, how do we get people to buy on Home Depot.com? It's so much more efficient, somewhat, yeah, I don't need to tell you this. There's there was the huge value proposition in getting e-commerce to work. Yet they were still going into their bricks and mortar stores. And so the second reason Home Depot bought blinds.com was that they could learn Jay's secret sauce for selling complicated products that needed to be installed on a website. And they thought if we could graft his knowledge across $100 billion worth of revenue, and even if it's just making it 1% better or directing 1% more people to homedebook.com, it would have a massive impact on their overall revenue. And so that was the hidden reason that Home Depot bought blinds.com. And that's the definition of a strategic 
acquisition where there is some strategic sort of reason that it's the company is more more in someone else's hands than it's than it is in your hands look at that it took 10 minutes to dodge your question no uh, but that, that, <laughs> that, is, that is the answer right and that, that's that's the challenging that's the challenging question that ha- that comes up quite often like i get that question often in our community people will be asking well what's a good valuation for my business and that kind of long-winded answer is the answer that it's got to be in the right person's hands. It's interesting. There's a couple been a couple of public exits in our e-commerce space. The Native Deodorant. I had Moyes, the founder of Native Deodorant, on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. They sold to Procter and Gamble for a hundred million dollars on a hundred million dollars in revenue, a deodorant company. And perfect example of strategic acquisition. A natural deodorant company in the hands of Procter and Gamble, way more value valuable than in the hands of Moyes and their small team. Um, mm-hmm. Pure Vita bracelets, movement watches are two other big companies that have sold for hundreds of millions of dollars. And both of them were bought by strategic uh, b- strategic investors who ran larger companies that they could just suck in this incredible direct to consumer brand and learn from it, learn the secret sauce of selling online. Yeah. One of the biggest mistakes we made, and I had the Pure uh, Vita guys on my podcast. It was great. A great episode. One of the things that that I think you, I think the, the the mistake that we make, and I think it's pretty natural, is that we approach acquirers from our point of view with with a kind of lens on of our business. And so the wrong way for Jay Steinfeld to approach Blinds or Home Depot would have been, why don't you buy Blinds.com Home Depot and think about any more blinds you can sell through Home Depot stores. Because Home Depot, frankly, kind of cares about being number one in their category. So that might have played a little bit, but it sort of fails to understand what Home Depot is trying to do. Home Depot doesn't give a crap about selling your product. They care about selling their product. And so what they want to do is sell more of their 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 products and services, their business model, right? So they've got a whatever $100 billion of revenue. They want to get better at selling their customers through their channels, et cetera. And so I'm sure Jay did this. I don't have proprietary knowledge to this, but I would imagine he did. He, he approached them to say, let me help you achieve your goals. So instead of like the Pure Vita guys saying, hey, think about how many more bracelets we could sell if, with your distribution, that would be a very selfish way to look at it. They, they would say, they would approach a uh, strategic and say, great, what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? And let us figure out how we can help you achieve by acquiring Pure Vita bracelets. So it's just a bit of a kind of flipping the, the natural way we would think about approaching a strategic partnership kind of on its head. That makes so much sense when you flip it around like that and think about how, because these larger companies are thinking in different ways than a smaller company. Um, you bet. I would, so one of the most powerful parts of the book, there was a little quote and I think you were at some sort of a, I don't know if it was an event or a convention or someone was speaking and they said something, which was your job as an entrepreneur, and I'm, I'm par- going to paraphrase oh, right. a parap- your, your paraphrase from the book, but your job as an entrepreneur is to hire salespeople to sell your products and services so you can spend your time selling and marketing your company. You can make a few hundred grand selling your products, or you can make exponentially more selling your business. You have the right skills, but you're selling the wrong product. That is a very interesting statement Mm, that I think very few people who are running businesses uh, would agree with or have have the elevation in their like life and mindset to understand that that is the truth. What does that mean to you? And how have you, how has that changed the way that you think about marketing your own business? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's everything. I mean, the story goes back. It, uh, I was invited or applied and was accepted to go to this thing called the birthing of giants, which has no word of lie, the most pretentious name ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's since been rebranded the entrepreneur's master's program, ENP. It's run through EO, entrepreneurs organization. Anyways, I, this goes back uh, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago. For me, I attended Birthing of Giants. And I was got, got like a young entrepreneur at the time. And it was at the MIT Executive Education Campus. This very kind of hallowed, you know, 
IV across the walls, et cetera. And it was in this, I remember an amphitheater style seating, and we got a chance to hear from some of the amazing voices of the business world at the time. Jack Stack, who wrote A Stake in the Outcome. Um, Pat Lynchoni, he was just early in his career, the guy at the five dysfunctions of a team guy, and he's gone on to write so many more books. Anyways, one of the last speakers who came in, I almost skipped, is a guy named Stephen Watkins. And he was an entrepreneur who had sold his company. And I was kind of, at the time, I was in the depths of like running my business, lots of challenges. And I, was, I, I kind of was, didn't want to hear some Pollyanna, like rags to riches story. I kind of, I just was kind of made me want to puke. I just didn't, I wasn't interested. And, but all my buddies were going, I'm like, all right, I'll go. He walks, I'm so glad I did. He walks in and he's like, first thing he says, okay, raise your hand. And there were 62 of us in the room. I remember the size of the room. 60, how many of you are involved in selling your product or services. And like all of us, like throw our hands up in the air, like little four-year-old, you know, four girls in class, like trying to pick me, pick me, like all of us really proud of the fact that we were selling our products. And he's like, all right, great. And he took a big pull of his water and he's like, you guys all have the right skills that you're selling the wrong product. And you're, you mentioned in your introduction, this question, it was like one of those moments for me where I was like, Oh man, I didn't even think of that. And I, it was like, I, I've been playing like amateur baseball and all of a sudden like faced an actual <laughs> professional pitcher. And I was like, Oh my gosh, it's a totally different game. He was just trying to communicate that all of us as most of us as entrepreneurs, not all, but many entrepreneurs are good at influencing. They're good at telling a story. They're good at marketing, sales, funnel building, all that crap. And we invest all that energy in, in building funnels for our company. And when you do that, boom, lo and behold, you sell a product or you sell a few products and you sell a few thousand products and, and, and great. But if you just, as Watkins said, turn those skills, not on selling your products, but on selling your company, on marketing your company, on creating funnels and partnerships so that you've got acquirers coming to you. As you said in your introduction, you make exponentially more when you sell your company. So all of us, I think, as entrepreneurs have the right skills, but many of us are, are just injecting them in the wrong product. And, and I think you hire marketers and salespeople to sell your product, but you as the entrepreneur should reserve those precious resources into marketing your company and making it the valuable asset that it will one day become. You, you mentioned the idea of like an amateur pitcher versus professional pitcher, right? That's an yeah. interesting comparison. Why do you think so few entrepreneurs make it to like the professional level? I think some of it's ego. I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, we like the feeling of being needed and wanted. I know in professional services, that's a thing. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing in, in, in e-commerce, maybe it's not quite a thing. I know that a lot of e-commerce guys, like they talk about, oh, their product launch was a six-figure product launch or their product launch was a seven-figure product launch. And they're deeply proud of that. And I think there's something... There's something that that gives us that sense of self worth and, and and purpose that solving a big challenge for our company and it, it, it so there's maybe something uh, something to that maybe I don't know what would you say I I think in professional services it's it's that solving that client problem that is an ego but in e commerce I'm not, I'm not sure I'd, I'd be curious to know your thoughts on that I, mean, I think I think it's similar in the sense of like the desire to be needed wanted to feel valuable. Uh, this, this, like the transition from the need to like grind really hard and work really hard when you're starting your company to that actually being a detriment to your business as it gets a little bit larger and, you know, the mindset shift to be able to feel comfortable, not being the one solving all those challenges. I think your point on ego, I think no matter what business, I, I feel like ego is probably the main reason. And it's, it's fascinating to see the people who have transcended that and can think at a higher level. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think um, it's probably our greatest strength and perhaps our greatest liability, right? That takes a lot of balls to say, I'm going to do something no one's ever done before. I'm going to, I'm not going to go to work at Procter & Gamble. I'm not going to go to work at Ford. I'm actually going to start something. And, and that's actually really courageous. And that confidence probably helps in the first few years of a business to just blow it, you know, any obstacle in front of you down. 
That being said, as you grow and mature, it, it may actually be a detriment. And, and look, I, I, every media outlet known to man and, and woman <laughs> is promoting growing your top line revenue, right? Like, yes. like you think about, oh, you know, Joe Smith uh, reached 6 million in sales or the Inc. 5000 is the 5,000 fastest growing companies in the United States. It's the, it's this kind of culture of celebrating the larger business, the, the one that employs more people or turns over more revenue. And I think it can actually uh, hurt us a little bit in terms of the, the what what drives value. I remember I, I had uh, Rob Walling on the show. Rob built a, a little company called Drip. They did email marketing. And it was right after, like a few days after I'd interviewed a guy who built an e-commerce business um, selling it. I won't tell you the name of it because it, 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 it would shine, shine a, 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 rel- a relatively negative light on his company. But he, he built it up to $15 million in revenue and sold it for about 25% of one year's revenue. So if wow. you're doing the math, whatever that is. Uh, so not a great outcome, not a, not a great exit. I, two days later, I interviewed Rob Walling. Rob built Drip and he built it the slow way. He built it on his own cash and built this wonderful, this kind of email marketing solution. Anyways, he got to 2 million in annual revenue when he was entertaining offers in the nine to 12 times top line revenue. He wouldn't even show up in the ink list. He wouldn't even, no one would bat an eye when Rob walked into a room with like eight employees and everybody would look at the guy with 15 employee or 15 million in revenue and go, wow, that guy's a superstar. Rob, wouldn't it be great if one day your business could be as big as his? (laughs) Yet behind the scenes, Rob's selling his business for like five, 10 times what the $15 million company. And that's just I've seen that again and again and again and again in what I do, uh, interviewing these entrepreneurs about their exits. My point being kind of revenue tends to be vanity, whereas we talk a lot about you know, value being sanity, this notion of, of focus on the value of your company, not the size of your company. The size is sort of what you boast about at the barbecue. Uh, what actually matters is the value. That combined with one of the things you said earlier, which was like having, a, having some pull Feet, some pull reasons, that's where you get very successful exits. It's like pull combined with focusing on the value and those two things and, and thinking of the future as something that's bigger that comes comes together in something really exciting. I would love to hear because you've, you've written three books and two of those books were more about the actual tactical reasons around tactical ways of increasing value. What are some ways that e-commerce businesses can increase their value and think about long-term value of their business? Well, the big one is recurring revenue. Yeah, the, 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 the Achilles heel of an e-commerce business is that there's generally no recurring revenue. And what you, what you really want is recurring revenue for two reasons. Number one, every dollar of recurring revenue is going to be worth a whole lot more than the transactional revenue you get from your website. So you got to figure out a way to create some sort of subscription, some sort of, uh, you know, automatic sort of plan. Uh, so that's absolutely critical in my view. Uh, number two, it creates something called the Trojan horse effect. And the Trojan horse effect is once people subscribe to that bottle of vitamins that you sell or that, you know, bracelet, they, you know, they opt in for one new bracelet every quarter or whatever, it makes them infinitely more likely to buy additional things on your website. So once they subscribe to Birchbox, it makes you more likely to buy the products from Birchbox as an example. I'll give you one other one that may be less well known. There's a guy named James Murphy who I interviewed on Build Cell Radio. He's actually in the art of selling your business as well. He built a company called Viviscal. Viviscal is a hair loss product, but it's not for guys. It's actually for women. Women also deal with thinning hair, but it's usually for environmental factors, hormonal issues that they're going through and they lose their hair. And James Murphy realized this early and built a wonderful product. Again, got it like endorsed by Reese Witherspoon and all these quite famous actors in Hollywood, built it up to $50 million of annual revenue, Uh, ultimately sold it in a wonderful auction where he played one buyer off the other to C&D, the makers of Trojan condoms for uh, $165 million, so $50 million business. So put that into perspective with the deodorant guys, they sold for one times revenue. James Murphy sold for three and a half times revenue. 
So pretty amazing outcome. A pretty favorable (laughs) exit. Yeah, but here's the secret. One third of his revenue at the time of his exit was coming from women who had subscribed to an auto ship of Viviscal. Makes sense, right? You need this stuff for your hair on an ongoing basis. It's not something you'd use once and you know set it, forget it. So I think if you can, I mean, an e-commerce business is an attractive asset for sure. If you can add in a recurring element to it, it just jacks up the value enormously. So you're asking yourself, what do my customers run out of, right? What what are they, you know, Dollar Shave Club? I mean, all these kinds of e-commerce. Yeah, the replenishables. Yeah, something that run, you know, you run out of. Yeah. Uh, But from my own personal experience, combination of reading your book, um, reading Robbie Baxter's book around the membership economy. Great uh, book. Great book. Made some changes to my own business and added moved almost a hundred percent to subscription recurring revenue. Oh, fantastic. And it's been, it's been fantastic. It has really has been fantastic. I think there's two, two things. One, it increased the value like you've talked about, but also reduced stress. Um, Mm. The additional level of like knowing what's going to happen the next month, at least have some idea takes away a lot of the stress that you have from having to go out and hunt consistently every single month. I remember the first job, the first company I worked with, we were selling like high ticket, hundred thousand dollar, um, franchises Hmm. and it was feasted feast or famine. It was, you know, sometimes we'd have huge months and then you would have, there was no recurring revenue. And I remember the, the amount of stress that put on the organization because of these large deals that would come in, it was like, all right, everything's going really well. And then two months of sales dried up and everyone starts to feel the pressure of that going on. So I think there's like not just the value, also the psychological side of having that subscription revenue feels really, really good. Yeah, I think there's a psychological element. I think you're absolutely right. There's nothing worse than beginning of the month thinking, God, how am I going to do it all over again <laughs> this month, right? Like how, like yes. what, what, what on earth am I, like what rabbits am I going to pull out of a hat to like kind of do exactly what I did? That's a very, very hard feeling. It can make you feel like you're just kind of treading water and not building anything. So I think that's, I think that's psychologically very damaging. I think there's also a practical component to creating subscription. And you talked a little bit about it is, is the predictability of the business, not only from a cash flow perspective, but also from a, a supply perspective, which I know a lot of e-commerce companies think about in the context of they've selling a physical product and you've always got to balance supply and demand. You know, there's a, a story in the automatic customer, the book I wrote on this, on this kind of topic of recurring revenue, uh, about the guys from H bloom who got into the business of selling flowers on subscription. And when you unpack that story, it turns out that flowers are a terrible business to be in. Like if you've had like a, like a retail flower shop, like good luck to you, (laughs) you know, like it's, really lumpy, like Valentine's Day and Mother's Day, like is what you do with like a third of your revenue. You're the 363 days of the year, you got to figure out how to create you know, customers. Um, but what's really interesting is the flowers, you know, once the farmer cuts the flower from the stem and ships it to your store, it's already starting to die, <laughs> oh, <yeah>. right? And, <laughs> and, and, and the typical flower store will throw out, get this, 60% of its inventory every single month because it's rotting in the bottom of your fridge, right? They guessed wrong. They fit, you know, they, they thought there were, you know, there were too many roses, not enough carnations, whatever. H. Bloom comes along and says, okay, there are these hotels out there that want this very fancy image. And so they want flowers every single week on their, you know, reception table. We'll sell those guys a subscription. The average lifetime value of an H. Bloom subscriber is more than $4,000 compared to the average transaction in a flower store of around 50 bucks. So they make one sale and they get $4,000 worth of sales from that. But what's really, again, the, the sort of hidden thing that I think a lot, a lot of people think about, but I think it's arguably the most important element of a subscription model is that it makes the business so much more predictable. At H. Bloom, they only buy the number of flowers for which they have subscribers. And so their spoilage rate is not 60% per month. It's less than 2% per month. 
Think about how much more profitable that business so is than a high, like you've got four grand, you make one sale, you get four grand worth of lifetime value. And instead of throwing out half your inventory, you're throwing out less than 2%. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And so you can pass I, along a savings oh, to sure. those hotels that still leaves you with a way better Tons margin. Of margin. Yeah. Yeah. You can hire salespeople. You don't have to rely on just inbound marketing tactics. You can have outbound marketing tactics. You have salespeople call on a hotel. If their lifetime value of a subscriber is more than four grand, you can hire some kid to go call on every hotel in your region. I mean, it totally changes the, 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 the math of running your business. If you can somehow create some sort of automatic or recurring, uh, component to it. It's, it's fascinating. It's really, really interesting. Um, I, I want to transition to something that I read or I heard you talk about somewhere. And that's that you, that you think about your life in 10 year chunks <laughs> where you work on something for 10 years and then you move on. So my question for you is, is that something you still do? And if it is, where are you in your <laughs> 10 year chunk. <laughs> That's really funny. Uh, yeah. So look, I wrote a blog post years ago called life in 10 year chunks. And, and here's the thing I think, um, uh, you know, if you go work at a law firm or you want to go for work for, you know, poor Procter and Gamble, we keep throwing them over the, under the bus here, <laughs> but if you want to go work at Procter and Gamble or Ford or Microsoft or one of these companies, you know, it's some measure, it's a life sentence, right? You are on that career ladder and you've got to just get one rung underneath you and get your ass on the next rung and just kind of keep climbing, 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 right? You don't have the luxury of sort of stepping off and pausing and because the, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the, your skills will atrophy, your political capital in the organization will, and your reputation will atrophy very quickly. And it basically can put a, a, a stunt to your growth in that career. As an entrepreneur, I think we have many downsides, but one of the tremendous upsides of a career in entrepreneurship is the ability to put the, press the pause button, is to build a company, sell it for what it's worth at the time, hit pause, spend some time doing something else, and go start another company. The same skills that you learn to build your first company will be the essential raw material for building your second company, only you have the incredible luxury of taking a pause at a time in your life where for many people, they miss the critical time because they're too busy on the ladder, right? They get to be 55 when they've got more money, but they've got less time. They've got less time to go. Uh, their kids are grown up and they're like, okay, now I have time to pause. And the kids have left. And, you know, it's, it's such a challenge. Whereas I think the real tr luxury we have as entrepreneurs is to build, sell, reformulate, reassess, take some time off. And so, yeah, I, I, I had the, the tremendous, I'm very grateful for having sold my last company when I was, I think 38 or something like that. And I had run it for about 10 years. Uh, and I just wanted to go do something. We had young kids at the time. They were, I think they were three and five. And we just said like, we want to do something really different with our life. And it's a great opportunity to do that. So at 38, we moved to a little village called Aix-en-Provence, which is in, in France down sort of the South by the Med. It was beautiful, incredible experience. Three years, put our kids in school, French school, traveled all over Europe. And I mean, I look back on it with just rose colored glasses, tremendous gratitude and just an incredible life experience. And and, it, and it's one of the benefits, I think, and maybe why I feel so passionately about this topic of building to sell, because uh, because I just, for me, that is is such an indelible part of who I am, who, my relationship with my kids, my relationship with my wife. It's so, so material because we did that. And now I'm, to answer your question, you know, your question more directly, I started Value Builder, the, the software company I run today, uh, you know, in 2013-ish. So yeah, I'm coming up on eight, on eight year eight. Better get off the hop here and uh, <laughs> figure out what's next. But yeah, I, look, I, ten, there's nothing magic about 10 years, but I think there is this episodic nature of what we're doing. And um, I just think it's one of the tremendous luxuries. I think, frankly, when I see people, like I've got a friend who runs a company, He's it built a very successful couple million dollars of EBITDA. You know, he could sell it tomorrow. It's a protected niche. It's a great business. And he's 55 and has been doing it since he was 25. 
And I'm kind of like, dude, like life's short. Like, <laughs> yes, you could probably go to the next, you know, the next tranche and the next, you know, like for sure you could. And you're probably beyond the point of ever having to work again if you sold that company. So what's the yeah. point? Uh, we talk a lot about this thing called a freedom point, which is where if you sell your company, uh, if the proceeds of selling your company create enough wealth basically to live for the rest of your life, effectively what you're doing in not selling is you are that gambler uh, uh, that Joey talked about where you're effectively putting all the chips on the table. You know, we, yeah. we don't know when the next pandemic is going to happen. God forbid the next black swans, you know, we don't know what's next. Uh, whereas if you, if you sell, you, you take a lot of wealth that's tied up in a, in an illiquid asset and create a bank account that you can live off for the rest of your life. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's something to think about seriously. Well, it sounds like you had a tremendous pull for your first yeah. company, three, that, like the pull factor of let's go live in Europe, which is back to living what you're writing. It's that makes a lot of sense. It's like, all right, we're, I'm doing this incredible thing. I can do something incredible that I want to do. I think that that is so interesting. Just the idea of thinking about what is your pull? Like, why are you doing this anymore? Right. It, Right. It, that that I resonate with that really strongly because at my lowest points, I feel that when I'm like, I'm like, okay, I've been doing this for years. Why am I doing this? And at my highest, I'm like, okay, now I really, really feel why I'm, I'm still connected to this business and I love this. And if you get yourself stuck in a low cycle for a while, I can really see how it's hard to get out of that. And mm -hmm. you can get trapped in that in that business and then it can be 10 years, 15 years down the road and run out of time. It, it can also, yeah, you can get trapped for sure. And, and oftentimes inertia takes over where like you're making good money, you know, and, and someone says to you, oh, well you could sell your business and I'll just throw out a number. Maybe you could get uh, four times EBITDA. I'll just throw that. Yeah. And they say, well, why would I sell this thing? I hardly work more than 10 or 20 hours a week. In four years, I'll have all that money and I'll still own my business. And I, I, I had a chance to interview Tim Ferriss. I asked him about why he sold BrainQuick in the, the supplements company you used to run before he became a rock star author. And he said, John, it, it felt like my mind was always running antivirus software. I only worked in it five, six hours a week, right? I kept pushing a few emails around. I mean, he wrote about it in the book, but, but no matter how little I actually worked in the company, it was always taking up cycles on my CPU, right? It was always slowing down my brain. I was always worrying subconsciously, getting up in the middle of the night thinking about, and, and there is, I think, a tremendous insight there that although you may have reduced the time you have to spend on your company, I think that is one element. But I think the other element is the, is the intellectual, you know, the psychological weight of owning a business it cannot be underestimated. And I think, you know, creating that wealth that allows you in Tim's case to, uh, to take the time to write the book, to promote the book. I mean, it, 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 oh, and it created an entire new trajectory of his life. Had he continued to run big brain quick and for the next 50 years, sure. He would have made good money, but like, I'm not sure he would have been quite as happy. I, I don't know. Yeah. You have to ask Tim. Yeah. I, I don't know. For <laughs> a freedom accelerator to a certain extent. So it's That's like, right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would love to go a little bit more tactical as we kind yeah. of wrap this thing up. What are some of the biggest mistakes that business owners make as they go through the process of selling their business? Hmm. Yeah. So one of the big mistakes that, that's happening right now in the e-commerce space is that, that, that folks are selling to PE firms, private equity firms, and taking part of their proceeds in shares of a new entity that the PE firm sets up. And when I say mistake, it, it, it can work out really, really well. I've had examples of people like doubling their money in a year or two by doing this. And I've also heard lots of horror stories. So here's the deal. Private equity company comes to you and says, wow, you built this amazing business. We want to buy your company. And they say, but you know, we, 
we don't actually have management to run your business. So we'd like you to continue to run it. So we're going to buy 70% of your business and we're going to ask you to keep 30% of your shares and we're going to roll it into a new entity. So you're going to be a minority shareholder, a new entity, and we're going to stitch you together with two or three other businesses, just like yours. And we're going to get a higher multiple for the collection. So that second tranche of your equity, the 30% that you left in the business is going to be worth even more than the 70% you sell us today. Sound good? It's called the second bite of the apple strategy. And it's, it's so cliche. It's, I even hate uttering it. And on paper, on the surface, it, it, it kind of makes sense. It, it sounds appealing. You get to put some money in your jeans and it can be very lucrative. It can also end in disaster. I'll give you an example. Ryan Moran is a guy who had uh, built uh, a great business called Sheer Strength. They were in the supplements business like Tim. And he built it up to $10 million in revenue when he got an offer from a private equity company. I believe it was for $18 million. He had a partner on the business, and so they were splitting the proceeds. Now, instead of getting 100% of the cash up front, he got 60% of the cash, and 40% was rolled into a new entity. And Ryan didn't want to have a boss or managers or, you know, he's an entrepreneurial guy. So he's like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm out. So the private equity company brought in an e-commerce executive to run the company and they proceeded to screw it up royally. So much so that the company started to fail under new leadership. So much so that the private equity company couldn't pay back the debt that it had taken on to buy sheer strength Ultimately, sheer strength, the new entity folded and Ryan was left with zero for the 40% of his business he left in the company. And so I share that story with you because it's one that I've heard from time to time that when you become a minority shareholder in a company you no longer control, you are putting your basically lot in someone else's hands. And oftentimes they don't have the same drive, the same knowledge, the same skills that you have that got you to the dance. And we can underestimate the value of that versus what they bring to the table. And so look, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes I see right now is, is, is trading your full control in your company for a minority position in a business you don't own uh, for this quote unquote second bite of the apple. That's a, that's a good one. It's a great, great story. Really exemplifying the challenge with that removing your your skin in the game to a yeah. certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. Another one is another one the, the whole the third section of the art of selling your business is all like these tips and tricks and sort of things to avoid. One of the other ones that 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 is I think an important lesson, especially for e-commerce executives and owners, is is answering the question that you asked me earlier, which is like what's a fair multiple for your business, right? A lot of people ask, you know, like, and a lot of acquirers will ask you, in fact, almost all of them will ask you, like, what do you want for your business? And it sounds like such a, <laughs> such, 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 such an innocuous question. It sounds like such a reasonable question, right? Like, hey, you know, like, I, I want to be fair to you. I don't want to waste your time. So like, give me a sense of what you want for your company. Um, and oftentimes they'll do it when your defenses are down. Um, I just interviewed a guy, uh, 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 Frank, I've forgotten his last name. He said they, they wind and dine him. They took him to the master's golf tournament. They took him out for an incredible steak dinner. <laughs> and after like the third glass of wine and the fourth glass of Zambuca, it was like, so what do you think you want for your company? And like, by that time he was putty in their hands and he shared the number and, and, and unfortunately, what that does is put a ceiling onto which you will never sell your business for. The other problem, and it's somewhat more of a hidden challenge is, is you say, okay, well, I don't want to put a ceiling on my value of my business. So I'll throw out some like crazy multiple, right? Like I want six times top line for my, you know, something like really crazy. The problem with doing that is that oftentimes you're going to turn off an acquirer before they even bet in and really try to learn about your company. If in an early conversation, you say some outlandish number that's totally out of market for the kind of company you have, they're going to rightly assume you're nuts and that there's no way that they could possibly negotiate yeah. with you and they're going to leave. And, and so you've lost the game before you even had a chance to have the dance. And so, look, I don't think there's any good answer to that question. I think what you want to do uh, is, is kind of defer and say, look, I'm, I'm a reasonable person. I'll, I'll be happy to entertain any reasonable offer you think is fair and let them sort of come to you with their offer. And you may be surprised what they come up with. Yeah. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's like back to negotiation one-on-one, but at a much higher scale. It's yeah. like the, 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 <laughs> the negotiation, you're not buying a trinket when you're on vacation, uh, where you're trying to go back and forth on something. No, it's a much, much higher, higher, higher deal. So keeping those things close to the vest. One question I get Thanks a lot about is high. like, is, um, earnouts, right? There's a lot of people that are f- like afraid of earnouts or, yeah. You know, it's like this, it's this looming thing like, oh, well, how much up front, how much, what's, what's coming from an earnout? If you're forced to take an earnout, what are some ways to set it up so you're successful? So, so that the earnout is successful. Try to tie it to your top line revenue, not your bottom line profit. Most earnouts are tied to the bottom line profit of your company as a division of your acquirer. So in the case of blinds.com, as an example, it would be like, okay, Home Depot can carve out blinds.com, separate line item, separate PL, and l and you know, measure Jay Steinfeld on profitability of blinds.com. That's how they try to structure your earnout. The challenge with that is that once you sell your company, you lose control of your finances. You don't have your bookkeeper, your in-house market, your in-house finance people. That all goes to head office and they give you your profit and loss at the end of the month. And oftentimes you don't have any way of interpreting that data. They can graft expenses onto your P&L that are kind of head office expenses. Uh, you just kind of lose control of the budgeting process. It can be very difficult to, to sort of run that, uh, run your finances when you're a division of some other large enterprise, especially if you get bought by some massive company. I mean, good luck trying to get the numbers that you need. Whereas <laughs> top line revenue is a lot easier. It's a lot harder to fudge. Right, like most people can say, no, no, that's the top line revenue. Like, look at the sales; those are that's the revenue of the company. And so, I like tying it to top line. I, in the case of Rob Walling, who I talked about earlier, he had the company Drip. He didn't want to tie it to top or bottom line for fear of you know just losing control of those things. But he he's a developer, and so the reason Lead Pages wanted to buy Drip was he he had a little feature that they were really keen to get, and and he had it on the product roadmap. So he tied his earnout to the launch of a feature that he as a developer felt 100% confident that he could bring to market. And so he went ahead and tied his earnout to the launch of the feature. The feature was launched on time and he got his earnout. So I'd encourage you to think about like, what do you, what can you control? You know, um, Rod Drury, I, I talked about him in the book, he built a company called Aftermail. He sold it for $35 million. That was the headline number. When I interviewed him, what I learned to discover was that he actually sold it for $15 million with a $20 million earnout. And when he sold it, he sold it to Quest. Aftermail was a little software application that most Fortune 500 companies needed. Quest had relationships with almost all of Fortune 500. And what Rod had to do was figure out a way to get into this sort of briefcase of the Quest salespeople. Well, what do you do when you're a when you're a young guy and someone hands you a check for $15 million? You go have a party. <laughs> you like you take your foot off the gas and you you have some fun, right? Like that's life-changing money. The last thing he's thinking about is getting on a plane and going and visit all these Quest salespeople and like explaining the benefit. Like he's having a good time. Yeah. So he wake up, he woke up a couple months later realizing that, oh man, I got to get off the hop here and start, you know, selling this product through this distribution channel. But by that time it was too late. The way earnouts usually work is they're like a, they're like a ski course. Uh, like if you miss a gate, it's very hard to recover. And so earnouts are usually gated. So you, your budget is released when you hit the first gate. And if you miss the first gate, it's very difficult to get the budget to get to the second gate. And so it's like this domino effect. And in Rod's case, uh, he missed the first gate, left nine months after with nothing for his earnouts and walked away from $20 million. Now, he went on to have a tremendous success. He he started zero, which became a unicorn. I mean, he's, no one has to worry about Rod. He's been yeah, yeah. an amazing success. But the point being, earnouts are at risk, and if you could tie it to something you can control, I think you're in better shape. I like he made a point. I think it was a, you quoted him that if you can delay your earnout by a little bit of time, maybe yeah. a few months, then that can gives you some time to maybe celebrate a little bit, recover. And then come back into it so you don't miss your first gate, which I thought was very interesting. I, I, I think it's a really before. smart point. And just give yourself 60 days to like decompress and, you know, like selling your business is like an emotional, it's a freaking emotional roller coaster. And so you need 
a couple of months just to sort of come off that, you know? And uh, For sure. I think that makes a ton of sense. And that was, yeah, that was Rod's idea. It's just like, give yourself 60 days to sort of digest this and then start worrying about hitting your earn out. John, this has been fantastic. I um, uh, really appreciate you hopping on and chatting with me. And I highly recommend the book. Um, you should go, go if you're... If you're thinking about selling the business in the future, definitely go pick it up because it's a, it's a relatively short read. I got through it in like a, a night and a half and learned a lot. Um, so I really appreciate you putting it together and uh, chatting with me. If somebody wants to learn more about you, where's the best place? Where would you direct them? I think the best thing to do is go to builttosell.com and there's a little button in the top right corner that says free gifts. And if you click on that, you can download... Uh, the nine subscription model checklist, which is how you can figure out some of the subscription models we talked about today. There's videos on creating recurring revenue as well as just driving the value of your business. I think the the book, The Art of Selling Your Business has a, a sister kind of workbook that you can download for free from, from, you get it all when you just opt into those free gifts. So it's just built to sell.com and then you click on the free gifts button. Awesome. John, thank you so much. Great to chat with you. Thanks, Austin. It's good to be with you. <laughs>